All right, Entree Architect community. It's 4 p.m. Eastern. That means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Conversation for Friday, February 24th, 2023. It's the last Friday. It's the final Friday in February. That means it's time for the Context and Clarity Book Club discussion. So welcome. Thanks for joining us today. When you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here. Let us know where here is for you. What does that mean? Where are you joining this conversation from? If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis, and I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar. You said, hey, 2023 is my year, and I'm on the runway to starting my own thing. <laughs> or maybe you started your own thing a year ago or 10 years ago or 27 years ago, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that thing, what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day. They all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need to know topics for the success of entrepreneur architects just like you. As usual for these book club discussions, I am joined again today by Catherine McBail. Hi, Catherine. Hello, Jeff. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you. How was the ice storm last night? No ice here. No ice. No, no. no. Denver, ice, ice baby. No, snow, no ice. It is. Uh, it was bad. I guess it was bad around Boston, but I, not here on the South Coast. Okay. All right. So well, lucky for me. Well, it was lip syncing anyway. So. Um, lip syncing. Ice, ice, baby. Oh. Wasn't he? Wasn't he lip syncing? Or is it just for? No, yeah. It was, no, it was, it was after my time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get we'll get into uh, uh, '90s music. Is that that was '90s music uh, lip syncing trivia? We'll do that later. The '90s, to listen to Ice Vanilla Ice or whatever his name was. Vanilla Ice, and then the uh, the two guys. Anyway, Vanilli Vanilli. Milli Vanilli. That's yes, that's what I was. Vanilla Ice, Milli Vanilli. That's that's definitely a Jeopardy clue at some point. <laughs> I'm looking at the comments here, Scott Thrift. Is joining us again today from Twitch. He's got his his furry hat and glasses on. He says, crazy California weather. I think the entire state is having a snow day. And Jessica's in L.A. She says, it snowed on the Hollywood sign this morning. Uh, what? <laughs> that doesn't seem right. She says, I really need to go to the bathroom, but I don't want to make the run from my garage office to the house in the rain. How long can she last? We'll see. I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm not real sure. That's that's a different show. That's that's a different reality right there. Yep. <laughs> it's a it's some sort of game show, reality slash game show. Well, welcome back, Jessica from Los Angeles, Scott from from San Francisco, and everybody else as you're coming in, say hi. Let us know that you're here. Scott's the first in, so he's the winner of today's John Kinney Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. And um, if you're over on Facebook right now and you're commenting away and going, hey, why aren't my comments showing up? Why isn't uh, uh, why aren't my comments about where it's snowed or where it's iced or, you know, being in Mexico or whatever? Why aren't they showing up? Well, it's because you're in a closed face group, Facebook group right now and you have to give Facebook permission to let your comments out. So down to the lower left corner of your screen right now, you can see a URL. You open up a separate browser window. You type chat dot. That's a period for those of us that are old enough. Restream dot IO slash FB as in Facebook. Chat dot restream dot IO slash FB. And a couple of clicks later, you'll give Facebook permission to let your comments out, just like Jessica's are. Thank you, Jessica, for sharing that for Arturo. Uh, hopefully he can join us. If Arturo gets here before anybody else, then that means we have a California hat trick on hand. It would be San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego. That's that's kind of a nice coastal cool. drive. Oh, yeah. Until Diego. It would be all California, yeah. I thought, until. It would be until Diego showed up. And we're glad that Diego's here from Nicaragua. Welcome mm-hmm. back, Diego. Glad you're joining us today. Um, as I said. It's book club day. Book it's the club. final Friday in February. And our book for this month has been They Ask, You Answer. 
yesterday for Context and Clarity Live, they ask you answer by Marcus Sheridan. On Context and Clarity Live yesterday, we talked with Marcus Sheridan. This is what he looks like on the back of the book. That's well, Marcus Sheridan. Let me, yep. can, can I see that again? Yeah. Up, over. Yeah. No, I can't really see him, but I did meet him yesterday, so. Yep. He had Heath bars in the uh, green room. Yep. Yesterday. So he was our guest for Context and Clarity Live. We're trying to do that as much as we can for our, our book club books this year, line up an author and a book. So we'll see how it works for the rest of the year. But um, so two, two things. First of all, in the comments, have you started or have you read or listened to? They ask you answer, yes or no. Put that in the comments. And then um, the second question is, were you able to join us yesterday for Context and Clarity Live with Marcus Sheridan? If so, say Marcus yes. If not, say Marcus no. So yes or no to the book and Marcus yes or no to... Marcus yes. <laughs> Marcus yes. Yeah, you were you were here firsthand in the room. I was, room yep. Mr. Marcus, yep. Absolutely. Luciana, welcome back. TGIS, she says. All right. Thank goodness it's Friday. Uh, Jessica says I haven't read it, but did listen in yesterday. Okay, so she's a she's a no, but a Marcus yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, Scott says have not read it, so he's a no, but he will. So he's he's a maybe. I'm gonna I'm putting Scott down as a maybe, and he's a Marcus yes. All right, very Wait, good. Marcus yes is yes. You watched yesterday. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Let's see, uh, Jessica. Jessica's helping out over there on the Facebook side. Thank you for that, Jessica. Yes, you, if you if you say, um, "Hey, I already went through that that uh, that chat dot restream dot io slash fb link before," it expires at some point. I don't know what the timing is. So um, if it's not, you know, if you say, "Hey, I did that in the past and it's not working," just try it again. Uh, again, it's just a couple of clicks. I know it's a little bit of a pain. It adds some friction, definitely. But uh, that's that's what's going on there. Or if you if you just can't get it, jump over to YouTube. It's su it's super simple. Uh, if you go to go to the Entree Architect channel on YouTube, which would be YouTube slash at Entree Architect, and it'll be live right there. It works really well on YouTube. If you can't get if you have some trouble for some reason commenting from uh, from Facebook, you can do it from that side. Any of the channels that we broadcast to, you can watch it. You can listen. Uh, you can always you can also comment from right now. Scott is over on Twitch. Jessica's on Facebook. Daryl, happy Friday to you. He's on LinkedIn. Um, haven't seen anybody pop up from YouTube yet, but uh, YouTube's a great platform for it. Also, Twitter. Uh, you can uh, you can play on Twitter as well as it is today. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we'll see. Diego says hasn't read it yet. It was at the conversation yesterday. Yes, I remember you saying hi yesterday, Diego. I'm glad you were mm. glad you were able to uh, get it. Luciana says I heard the recording of yesterday's context and clarity and bought the book on Audible right after. Wow! All right, we're selling books here, but I yeah. haven't started listening you to it yet. Don't get any residuals for that. Hey, um, I have a I have a recommendation for Audible. I listen to it at 2.3 times speed, so I'm just he reads it very slowly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. I was probably on 1.7 or something like that. Yeah, I started 1.7, sure. and I just kept amping it up as time got less and less. So. <laughs> yeah, this, as the panic sets in, right. you just start dialing it up. Yeah, it. I get yeah. it. But, I get but it. it was possible to understand it at 2.3 times speed. So anyone who says they don't have time, it's only going to be a few hours at 2 times speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's not – I mean, it's it's a book, right? It's a, it's a hefty book, but it, it's – you know, it's no longer than anything else um, oh. that we read. I don't know what Audible said, like six hours or something like that, maybe? Or eight nine. hours, I don't know. Nine, nine, hours. nine hours, okay. But, you know, <laughs> we really don't have to listen to it at the actual speed. Right, right. Yeah. So, anyway, they ask you answer. Uh, we talked with the author yesterday. We're going to talk about the book today. Let's see who's here. Daryl's Daryl's here from LinkedIn. Glad to have you, Daryl. John Jones, welcome back from Chile. Westport. Yeah, yesterday I was talking about how there's this blizzard going on, and here in the Midwest we're like blissfully unaware. Well, today it's it's sunny. That's nice, but pretty frigid. Arturo, uh, it is working now. Arturo, welcome back from 
San Diego. And look at there, Audrey Whiskers joining us from Australia. Hi, Audrey. Australia. She's checking out YouTube for today's chat. Thank you. You can be the leader of the uh, YouTube fan club over there, Audrey. Glad you're here today. Chad, welcome back from the uh, <laughs> welcome back from the ATL. He says 2.3. OMG, was it like listening to the Chipmunks? Some um, somehow they 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 adjust the. Um, they it just like, pitch, right? about, yeah, it's not as much the pitch doesn't go up as much. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't feel like the the actual chipmunks, Simon, Alvin, and Theodore, just Marcus <laughs> Jefferson. Welcome back. He's he, Jefferson says he's here. He's derelict in duty. He didn't read it, but he saw the last half of yesterday's talk. Okay, and Jessica says my husband will be in Indy next week for the combine, and is gloating that it will be warmer there. Uh, hey, tell your husband to look me up. I'll treat him to a cup of coffee if he's interested. What's he doing? What does your husband do? Why is he going to be at the combine? What's a combine? It's the uh, NFL's combine for uh, incoming rookies or or draft hopefuls. It's here in Indianapolis every year. Um, Cool. I don't, uh, I haven't looked at the weather report. I know I'm, I forgot to post. If anybody is in Owensboro, Kentucky or Evansville, Indiana, that area, let me know. I'm going to head down there tomorrow morning. Uh, Jessica says he's a producer for the NFL Network. Very cool. Let's see. <laughs> Chet says Blizzard. It's 73 here. I got my sandals out. <laughs> yeah, well, that means you're not in Portland. You're not in northern Arizona. Let's see. John Jones says my daughter's boyfriend is a recruiter for the Giants and will be at the Combine. Okay. Everybody's coming to Indy next week. Arturo says he finished the audiobook. All right. Here's our star student. I know why Marcus did not narrate his own book. Pretty good. Pretty, he, he actually he did narrate his own book. I'm confused by that. He did. Um, right. So yeah, Marcus's I was wondering place. about that comment yesterday, Arturo, because you said I would know, and in fact, I did not know. Yeah, he uh, Marcus actually did narrate narrate the uh, audiobook, uh, but okay. he is he is a colorful character, and if you've I've I've not seen him speak in person. Um, if you ever have that opportunity, I would encourage you to. I've seen videos of him uh, speaking in person. He's a, he is a much sought after um, keynote speaker. And it's a little bit of a coup for us to get him, get him here. And like I said uh, earlier in the week, it's a little bit of a bucket list, not even a little bit. It was a bucket list for me yes, yesterday to be able to talk to him. But um, he, he's a very good, he's a world renowned keynote speaker and he brings I mean, you, you saw a little bit of it yesterday. He brings the uh, energy and the intensity. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, character. Arturo says because um, I had to pull my headphones off at one point, which <laughs> it scared you. <laughs> I sc- I think I just jumped really, but yeah, the volume was yeah. high in my ears. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have to There's talk to our audio uh, sound producer around here about that. Yeah. Have to work work the dials a little bit. Ed Shannon, he says he's just getting here from the cold, cold Des Moines, Iowa. Well, welcome back, Ed. Put a uh, put a fur hat on. Batten down the hatches. Stay warm. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. All right. So as everybody's getting in again, if you're just joining us, welcome to Context and Clarity. It's Book Club Day because it's the final Friday of the month. Um, and our book for the month is They Ask You Answer. That's what we've, we've, we've really just been talking about the author so far, Marcus Sheridan, because we talked to him yesterday on Context and Clarity Live. But it's time to talk mm-hmm. about his book. I did finally get a, a video recorded about the book. Decided to do one it's video fine. instead I'm of a series it. of. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I decided that the uh, a series of videos going chapter by chapter is, is just not sustainable for these for these books. Right. So you you got my biggest takeaways from the book. You can find those videos if you're curious. If you haven't watched them yet. You can go over to the Entree Architect Network. There's a channel for books in there. I post the videos in there. You can go over to the Context and Clarity Instagram account, which is, I believe, context underscore clarity. Um, yeah. You can find it there. You can go over to my TikTok, which is all of my social media is Jeff underscore Eccles. And underscore is that line down below, by the way. Sort of looks like a dash, but it's the one down at the bottom. And uh, you can find <laughs> the videos at all of those places. Sometimes you have to explain what an underscore is. <laughs> I think a lot of them are younger than we are, though, Jeff. So wouldn't they know? 
I don't, you know, I don't know. They, they call it, they call, they call this a, a hashtag. <laughs> Not to go too deep on it, but anyway, there may be a different name for it. Tic Tac Toe. Yeah, they call Tic Tac Toe a hashtag. We should bring that back. Tic Tac Toe, they ask you answer. <laughs> Tic Tac Toe, context and clarity. Yeah, we're gonna, that's what we're going with from now on. Good. Elizabeth Carmichael, welcome back. She says, hello from, I think, the city with the most Entree Architect members. Well, at least those who join Context and Clarity. That's a great point. We have a great Context and Clarity community in San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be Elizabeth and Arturo and Michelle and Pam. Am I leaving anybody out? Mm -hmm. That might be it. But that's that's a good number from where's Sit Lolly um Sit Lolly from? Uh she's in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so Sit, Sit Lolly shows up and um and Jefferson and Jessica. That would be three from LA. Uh, it's, uh so all right, here we go. <laughs> here we go lobbying, lobbying for different eras. Uh Arturo Erica is actually she went to school in San Diego. Got her master's in San Diego, but she's actually in New Jersey. So we're we're not we're not including her in San Diego. So we're getting back into these kinds of competitions. Yes, Michelle. Michelle is uh, is one of the uh, I'm going to call it the San Diego posse. Let's see. All right. All right. Well, let's let's um, let's talk about they ask you answer. What? Catherine, what uh, you listen to it at a very, very high speed, high rate of speed, well, the narration yeah. at a high Last rate of speed. Chapter was very high. In, in, an increasing rate of speed, I guess. Yeah, increasing. Accelerating. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what what are your biggest takeaways from the book? Well, um, one thing he mentioned yesterday, all votes rise. So the idea of educating the public who then might choose somebody else for the same thing that you do isn't a bad thing. It's because it's for the good of everybody if, if our clients are educated about it. Yeah. Um, you should ask uh, the questions that they want answers to or perhaps the ones you don't want to approach or you're hoping they're not going to ask you. So I made some yeah. on, my, on my website today that were things like... Um, do I really need an architect? And then I said, well, not to do this work. And I said, no. And then am I wasting my money if I don't need an architect? I mean, that would be a follow-up question to that, right? Anyway, right, so right. Stuff like that, things they might like to say to me, but don't feel like they have the, they would be able to. Yeah, anyway, that was. Goes on there and then it just gets through all those questions that people are, the fears that they're holding about hiring an architect. Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that was one thing that Marcus brought up yesterday that I had not really thought about. He said, you know, of course, we're dealing with human beings, right? That that have fears, and uh, you know, they don't they don't want to do some things, or nervous about some things, and they may not want to ask that question out loud, right? They may not want to ask you that question, but they still have that question that needs to be answered. So I thought that was a, uh, um, I thought that was a, a really good point yesterday, and you you mentioned educating the public, and that's that's what I have thought. Um, for a long time, those of you that don't know, you've heard me, you know, maybe gush about this book a lot this week because I've listened to it a number of times now. And the thing that has always struck me in our world, you know, in our profession is that a lot of us complain that people don't understand the value of an architect or don't know the difference between an architect and a unlicensed designer or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. complain that people are being educated by HGTV and, you know, all those, all those pretty common complaints that come up and, yeah. and what's really being um, advocated for, I guess, in, in the book is to change that. It's mm -hmm. to think about the questions that they have asked or not, they still have the questions whether or not they're asking you the questions is another important point. You know, if they're, if they're finding answers somehow on HGTV, what can you do about that? Right. You, you can start answering these questions. And, and of course what he, what Marcus said was we all have a personal responsibility to take this on. 
Yeah. It, you can't you can't turn to or, or lay it at the feet of of an association, an organization, et cetera. We all have to be able to to answer. And that that's that goes back to your comment about the raising raising all the boats. So mm-hmm. that to me is a, a big a really big takeaway. And then just the fact that, you know, overall, I mean, from a 30,000 foot view, I think this book is really about, uh, it's really sort of a formula for building trust. Mm -hmm. If you're the one that's answering the questions who are, that nobody else is answering, then who are they, you know, who are your prospective clients going to, uh, going to trust? Right. Well, one of the things I have, one of the questions I have was inspired by Chris Novelli's comment about his upcoming video about what if I don't like the design my architect came up with. So um, I think my question was, I have to look at it, but I think it was something like, what if I decide I don't want to work with you or something? So I said, this is what this is what you do. And then also you could listen to my podcast and figure out what I'm like. And you should know whether Mm -hmm. you like me or not like me. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So stuff like that, because like, what if, I mean, I think that is a big fear. I have hired somebody recently who um, I didn't know how much it was going to cost until I finally got the proposal. And then the proposal, and I kept saying, well, can I just get an idea of how much this whole thing might cost? And then it was $100,000 in the end, which I could have saved everybody a lot of time. Like, I'm just really not going to spend $100,000 on this system. Yeah. You know, but then it made me feel stupid because I was really trying to ask how much it was going to be. And then, um, yeah, anyway, it would have uh, just be more upfront about how, how much things cost is not going to scare people away if they can afford it. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's that's a good point. Right. I, I still think and, and he does address this in the book, but in a way, not in a way this it's meant to educate, but it's also meant to qualify. Yeah. Right. So he mentioned yesterday. So those of you that don't know, Marcus is, is often referred to as the swimming pool guy. That's where his story kind of begins. And he mentioned yesterday that, you know, he he used to get angry or, or frustrated. I don't remember what term he used, but he would go and meet with a with a prospect. And, and in that world, that would mean doing a sales call at their house. You know, and, and he talks in the book, he'd be he'd drive two hours to somebody's house to meet with them in the early days without ever having a conversation or anything like that. And imagine that that's four hours round trip and you have no idea whether or not this is a qualified prospect Mm -hmm. and you sit down, you talk with them, you give them a a proposal or, or estimate or whatever the swimming pool guy calls it. And they said, Oh, I thought a pool costs like $35,000. Yeah. You know, how many times as an architect, how many times have you run into that where somebody said, oh, I thought it would cost $3,000 or $8,000, you know, whatever, some, mm-hmm. whatever ridiculous number you want to want to uh, put in there. But, but if you had a, um, an article or a video or whatever that talks about, and, and, he, and Marcus broke this down yesterday, I thought this was great, talked about what can drive the price up. What can drive the price down? Why are some architects more expensive or real expensive or however you said it? And why are some architects really cheap? That's that's four different versions of that question. And not a single one of those says, what is your cost? You know, what does mm-hmm. it cost to hire you? But it educates them and prepares them for for the, the, the cost conversation, I guess. And if it keeps them from expecting to talk to you and get a proposal for three thousand dollars if if that's a ridiculous number so so i think it's a um you know it's a a good qualifier as well yeah who are we that woman we talked to okay i don't okay she was a marketing person and she was a woman okay and she was all about uh sending people away like repelling people who aren't going to be interested in you what was her name she had a partner, and then the part she, the partner didn't come. But then the partner's not working with her anymore. Oh, oh, um, um, yeah, that she, one. She was a speaker at uh, TCAM. Yes. Yeah, that's one. Her, that's her what name, I mean. Her name's... Anyway, so that's that's the same kind of thing she was talking about: is having your website be a way of filtering people out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so that's that I, there. There are there are. I know that there are people that disagree with that. In fact, I was talking to somebody 
Emily Sikorsi um, is oh, yeah. who you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody recently that is huge into Sandler sales training. And I'm, I'm not knocking Sandler sales training. I'm just giving that as background. Mm-hmm. And, and you actually, you actually asked this question yesterday, Catherine, you were, you were in a group and people said, Oh, I want to talk to as many people as I can. Oh yeah. 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 I don't, this, yeah. this, this person that I was talking to has the exact same attitude. I want to talk to as many people as I can because I think that I can sell them if I talk right. to them. Yeah. And you know, I think from from my point of view, and, and what what Marcus is talking about in this book, wherever it is, that book is is really approaching this from the client's point of view or the customer's point of view or whatever you know you call those people. You know, what is it that they're trying that they want? What are their fears? Like you said earlier, how can we put them at ease? How can we answer their questions? Because we have to build trust. It takes a tremendous amount of trust to say, "Hey, Catherine, I I'm gonna I, I'm gonna spend a hundred thousand dollars with I wish. you." I wish, Jeff. I gotta raise my fees. <laughs> and and I want you to design my dream house that mm-hmm. I hope that okay, well, I'll live in for nice the rest of my life. I don't think that kind of work. Perhaps you haven't been in my website. <laughs> there you go. That's there the conversation, go. right? But but when people you know, like that group that you were talking to or the person that I was talking to, I want to talk to the people and I can, I can sell them. Does that build trust? That's my first question. If, if you're trying to sell me, I am automatically, you yeah, know, in not- the context, in, in the, in the way that they're talking about, I mm-hmm. am automatically, and this is Jeff, I don't know if it's anybody else, but I am yeah. shutting down mm-hmm. and I am, I am trying to figure out how to get out of this conversation. I don't trust you. I don't want to talk to you. If I was buying a used car, I might expect that, but not if I'm hiring an architect. So I I don't, you know, I don't get that. Um, I don't get that at all. I don't, I don't buy that. I I don't think people want to be convinced. They don't, I don't want to have to convince anybody. Honestly, I need people. We, I think we all need clients who want to hire us because they know our value. So I mean, otherwise, it's not a good client. That's why I have felt. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked about um, this morning on our morning mindset conversation, we talked about courage. And somebody brought up the fact, because, you, you know, I was sort of focused on the courage it takes maybe to write some of these articles or mm-hmm. record a video about some of these articles. Oh, my gosh, I don't want to talk about that. It takes a little bit of courage to, to do that. And somebody flipped it around and says, you know what? It takes a lot of courage to be a good client. Mm-hmm. But, you know? That's it's true. It is true. It is true. You know, and somebody else said, well, courage takes faith and it takes trust. And I think that's the currency that we're, we're talking about here. Uh, those are really good points. Mm. Uh, let's see. I lost my place in the comments here. I saw, I've got to scroll now. Well, Chad, Chad says he wants to talk to as few as he can. And I feel the same way because it's such a waste yeah. of time. I don't have, I'm not, I, it's just a waste of time to talk to people who would never hire me. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Audrey says, uh, their, their FAQs are based on questions people have asked us, but there may be questions the public would feel awkward asking. I think that's a great point. Mm-hmm. It is, it is a really good point. And it's one of the things we've talked about all week because we started the week talking about the questions your prospective clients ask about hiring an architect. And then Tuesday it was, what do they ask about their project? And Wednesday it was, what do they ask about working with you? And it's important. And and Marcus talks about this in the book, but it's important to understand that they might not, they, those prospective clients may not actually be asking you those questions, Mm. but these are questions that they're trying to find answers to. So they're, you know, they're going to the magic Google box. They're going to your past clients. They're going to maybe a contractor that they've met or that they know. So why not be the person that's, or, or the firm that's been, um, been asked or, or that's answering those questions. Yeah. So I wrote a note here when I was reading the book that it, um, you should know what their issues are and help them to feel better. And why don't they buy is what he was saying in the yeah. book. Like why, yeah. why, what's keeping them from buying? 
Um, you know, I, I had a question and I see John Jones is here, but I remember um, a few months, I don't know when it was in the past, um, that website that lists all of the costs of an architect and it's pretty cut and dry. And, and you think I could just, what does anybody think of linking that website to my website so people can go there and look up in more detail all of the how architects set their prices? Yeah, yeah. Put put in the comments what you think about that idea. Now, um, I love that website. Yeah, yeah. John John asked a question yesterday. John Jones asked a question yesterday about basically going together with some other architects to to write articles, or I forget exactly how it was phrased. Marcus videos, didn't like yeah. that idea. Mm -mm. Um, the, the in the book, there's an example. Actually, it's the River Pools example. So that's that's his company, or that was his first company was River Pools. And long story short, ish, they wrote a um, they wrote like a, an ebook or something called Swimming Pools One Hundred and One. So they had, um, if you go all the way back to the beginning of their story, they're trying to save the company, etc. And they sat down, they brainstormed. I forget if it was 100 or 200 um, questions. There's a lot of questions. There's over 100 questions. And they set about answering those questions in the form of blog posts. That's how they did it. Swimming Pools 101 is fast forward several years. And they wrote this guide that basically addressed the questions that prospects had you know, in the sales process. And what they did was, if I called and said, hey, Marcus, I'd like to uh, put in a swimming pool. Would you come out and talk to me on Friday? Can we make an appointment on Friday? You come out and talk to me. And they'd say, sure, um, we'll come out on Friday. But in the meantime, here's Swimming Pools 101. You know, here's a link to it. Download it. Read it uh, before I get there because it's going to answer a lot of the questions that you have and, yeah, and yeah, all of this. Time. Yeah. Yeah. And so when he talks about this, so this, this book was published in 2017, and then I think it was revised maybe in 2019. So I, one of the things I noticed in the revision in 2019 was that he talks about that and he gives, he, he kind of expands on that because he went from, Hey, this is it. Read it. You know, we'll meet if, if they'll call back Friday morning, if they figure out that you haven't read it, they won't come out for the, uh, for the sales appointment. But <laughs> one thing he's, that. <laughs> what's, what's that? Have you done your homework? I'm coming if you haven't done it. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's I don't what know if doing. I'd be able to say that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's it's bold, but it's bold. once you once you understand why they do it, I mean, it makes makes a lot oh, of it sense. It makes sense. Yeah, I just yeah. yeah. And he so what he says is, um, in the in this version of the book, he talks about the authority of the educator or the authority of the teacher or something like that, and he says, you know, when when we've written the book when we've written the, the swimming pools 101 and say, Hey, you need to read this. Somebody looks at it and they go, Oh, wow. These, these people are the experts. They've written the swimming pools 101 book versus if he found a swimming pool. So they're based in Virginia. If, if they found a swimming pool company in California that had a book like swimming pools 101 or, or so, a guide, you know, something like that and said, Hey, you need to read this before we'll come out and talk to you, that's a no go. You know, they, you lose that authority, you lose that leverage. And I thought that was a really, um, really interesting point. And I think it's true. It's like, well, why, why do you want me? And I think that's also a good lesson for us is, is okay. Do we use someone else's, you know, do we link to someone else's guide or article or something, something like that versus, producing our own you know mm -hmm. there's there's all there's a lot of layers to that i know but yeah that's true uh, i was just being kind of lazy because he'd already written it but well but maybe maybe there's a reference to it maybe maybe you yeah. use part of it and i don't know let's see um let's see, get some other john john says root and river he knew emily of course he is root and right. river uh, Elizabeth says in the, in the youth of my career on a contractor referral, I sketched 
for a prospective project, wrote up a proposal. She came back to me and said she, she thought it would be $500. <laughs> yeah, how many times has that happened? Uh, it's not funny, is it? I had already yeah. spent way more than that in my billable time already. Learned a valuable lesson. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think someone said yesterday during, someone commented during the show that the price shouldn't come in the proposal. It should be just a formality when we finally write up the proposal, but ideally we will have talked to them about it already, the price. That's that's straight. And I don't know if they're taking this from win without in. pitching, but that's that's yeah. straight out of that. Yeah. Yeah, and, it saves you so much that. time too. Yeah, I love it too because you're just being upfront about the cost. I mean, I think it's so... I think because this is my theory, because architects like what we do for the most part, that we feel like we should not be charging for it, maybe, or that we don't want to bring money into it to make it weird or anything. But really, we're just selling a service. So, yeah, you know, yeah, and that's, you know, one of the, I think one of the reasons that a lot of us don't like the idea of sales. And I'm sorry, but you can't avoid it by definition. You cannot avoid it. But I think one of the reasons that we don't like it is because we've had bad experiences. And I mentioned used cars. I mean, that that's sort of the the stereotypical, oh, used car salesman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you, it, it, in a lot of people's experiences, you get abused by salespeople and the, the sales manager and all of that when you go buy a car or used car or whatever. But ultimately, good salespeople, and Marcus Marcus talks about that freely in this book, is, you know, he's perfectly comfortable with making sure that this person, wh whoever they are, whatever they're after, finds the right solution. And if he isn't the right solution, if his product or service or whatever isn't the right solution, mm -hmm. then so be it, right? Good for them. You know, we need, it, it's it's sort of this, um, what is it, uh, Ian, is it Ian? Let me scroll back a second. Um, somebody... Ian Motley talked about. Yeah, um, he's a turtle. Yeah, blue blue turtle. Yep. He talked about um, uh, ethical ethical decision making or something, and that's basically, first of all, searching for the right solution for somebody and giving giving them the the I forget how he said it, but basically the autonomy of choice mm -hmm. instead of you, you know what we see otherwise mm. um it seems like a lot of people are afraid that they'll look elsewhere or get off your website or whatever because there's somebody out there like we're all the same or something and as long as they notice there's somebody else they'll go with somebody else but i i kind of think that it's kind of like choosing um you know other service providers that we do like maybe a person who cuts our hair all the time like we're not just gonna even though we know there are lots of hair shops around if we like our hairdresser or whatever our hair cutter we're not mm -hmm. going to go to a different one right even though there are others out there who might be just right. as good. It's kind of like having yeah. a husband or a wife. Like there might be others out there that are just as good, but you just make a decision and stick with it. Probably, <laughs> probably there are <laughs> or better. Yeah. Well, he, you know what he made uh, a really, he Marcus made a really good point yesterday. Um, it, and, and this is a problem. This is a problem with, Lack of education is that the right? No, that's not the right way to say it. Lack of information, lack of understanding. This is the problem with lack of understanding. Mm. When someone sees two or three options, and they don't, they don't see the difference between these two or three options. First of all, it's not their fault. No. Right. If someone sees an unlicensed designer and a licensed architect, a registered architect, whatever. And another registered architect, licensed architect. Yep. And and they they look at those three based on whatever information they've been able to gather through websites or conversations or whatever. When they look at those three and they go, these these three people are equally qualified. But they don't understand the difference between a non-licensed designer and a licensed architect. They don't. They don't understand it. No one has explained it to them. They don't have that understanding. They look at these three and they go, they go. These three are equally qualified. 
And there may be some other factors in there. There may be, you know, portfolio and style and things like that. But if, if all things being equal, right, if they are looking at these three and go, yep, I don't see a difference. There's, there's one, there's one more um, factor that they're looking at in their decision-making pro- process. And that's price. Price. Yep. And, you know, and, and like Marcus said yesterday, whose fault is that? Right. If you're one of those three, whose fault is that? I, I have a question for everybody. What's your question? I think it struck a nerve with the whole spouse thing. So I was just, <laughs> I was just, Anyway, but um, I have a question for everybody about what is the difference between us? There are three people, an unlicensed designer, uh, interior designer who says that they'll do the interiors of this thing, and then a licensed architect. I mean, are we really, is any licensed architect better than a designer, a designer? You know what I mean? Maybe it's just- Boy, now you're you're, you're stirring the pot now. So much better because we passed nine exams or however many there were. Yep. Yeah, I, th- I think that... Um, I mean, I just wonder, I mean, how do we say, like, I'm better because I'm licensed isn't really a good answer. Yeah, I mean, what you have to do... And remember, this entire book is about the client's perspective. Yeah, yeah. It's not even saying how good you are. It's just telling them what they yeah. may be wondering. Right. So, so anybody yeah. that's about to answer that question from the architect's point of view, it doesn't matter your perspective literally does not matter in this, in this scenario. What matters is their perspective. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, how, how do you explain? And, you you know, we got into this, maybe, maybe it was in, it was, yeah, I I think actually, I think Arturo brought this up in a comment earlier. It was in the context and clarity classroom earlier this week. Arturo was there and, uh, Chris Novelli and, and Christian, and I'm sorry, I know I'm leaving somebody out, a couple of somebodies, I apologize for that. But we got into the scenario where, um, you know, especially in residential design, mm-hmm. which, which is where this question comes up a lot, right? Yeah. Unlicensed designer, um, licensed architect, interior designer, et cetera, in the majority of the United States. So, so people in, in, um, New York, maybe New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you, you know, you're plugging your ears a lot right now and you're going la, 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 because this isn't true where you are necessarily. But in Indiana, in Oklahoma, you know, all across the United States, do, do I need, if I want to do uh, a new custom home, new custom home, new build custom home here in Indiana, do I need to hire a licensed architect? No. no. Does it benefit me, you know, from my point of view, as as a uh, prospective homeowner, someone that that um, wants to build this home, <clears throat> not understanding the difference between all these people, does it does your license? That's that's the way to ask it. Does your license benefit me? No, nope. no, it does not. Also, I'm wondering why do I have a license if I don't need one? What is it that? Me, I don't need one. So everybody's saying liability, but okay, why did I decide to take that on? Yeah. When I didn't have to, I don't know. I don't yeah. really know. Yeah. So the the important thing is, and and I'm not I'm not saying that you shouldn't hire an architect, obviously, but right. what I'm saying I mean, is we've got to flip that around to the client's point of view and say how how can you how can you answer those questions? How can you explain this? How can you help a, a client understand this without saying, well, I passed these tests and I have this license and I have this insurance and hopefully you have this insurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When that literally does not matter to them. Yeah. And it might make it more expensive for them. Right. Right. And, and that's the, that's the, uh, that's the trick, right? Yeah. I'm trying to see what some of the reactions here are. They're all positive. <laughs> I just, Let's see. John Jones says, I just spent a week with home designers. I begged them to raise their fees. I told them they do much of what I do and we all need to get better. Okay. I like that. 
Um, Chad says liability. I cannot take your money and run. I cannot drop your building on you and then shrug my shoulders. Um, yeah, okay. I don't know. It's like an addition is unlikely to drop on someone's head. Knock on wood. Yeah. Let's see. Ed says I had a guy come in today and asked me to stamp his tenant improvement. Yeah. Um, in Indiana, that's a felony. I first asked about his timeline. Needs it yesterday, of course. Of course it <laughs> it's, it's it's always it's like this. I always envision like I know timelines are horizontal, but I always envision somehow it's it's a vertical. And in those situations, it's like being sucked in the opposite direction. It's it's sort of <laughs> funny. I, I don't know some sort of cartoon thing. Uh, it says I, I told him I could not even get to it for eight weeks. He said he talked to another firm who could complete it in four weeks. But they were ridiculously high. I got a chance to educate this guy. Told him, first of all, his design would be considered as a suggestion. We talked about this the other day. This is uh, probably from Wednesday's conversation. Told him, I've been licensed for 27 years and clients' layouts don't help. They hinder. Told him he would get what he pays for. Most architects are 60 to 90 days backlogged. Uh, I did this all in a nice tone. And then referred him to a colleague who might be a better fit for them. And see that right there, that last uh, half sentence or whatever, that that is something that, and, and we get we hear this in this book, but I think this is sort of a universal thing for us. We really need to get comfortable with we may not be the right fit. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. There's lots of people who aren't a good fit with me, and and I don't want to work with any more of them who aren't a good fit for me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Why would we? Um. Let's see. Why would let's we? Because we need money, I guess. Because we think we won't have other opportunities, and. Yeah. Yeah. Will. That 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 came up this morning as well. It's you know the courage to say no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is, what is fear? The the way that I kind of think of it is what is fear forcing you to say yes to what is fear keeping you from saying yes to? Yeah. I said that right. Was it forcing you to say yes to what is it keeping you from saying yes to? Yeah. Fear's a big deal. It is. Yep. It is. Well, I don't know. I thought it was a pretty, I thought overall I'm going to give it a thumbs up the book. I know that you really like this book and it does remind me a lot of um, stuff that you say about marketing, you know, about look, mm -hmm. looking at it from the other person's point of view. At one point he said, I think he said, you should look at the front page of your website and the, for every five, well, for every one time you say, I, when I would say I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. say you five times for the uh, the yeah. prospective client. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, that was a sort of a magic ratio that he brought up. The magic. Yeah, that, ratio. that's yeah, it's magic. That's a that's a good point, and it, you know you just have to remember it's the the people. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a tangent, but I. When I used to be out on the speaking circuit, it always um, made me chuckle to myself when someone would come up, we'd have this discussion, they'd say, what differentiates us is our quality of design. And, you know, the first thing that would go through my head is, well, that that's great as long as anybody else, you know, as long as enough people agree with you, right? Mm -hmm. Because... I mean, it's, that becomes so incredibly subjective. And then the next thing that would go through my head is, if that's the case, why have I never heard of you? <laughs> because because then, you know, you're kind of making the Starkitect argument at that point. Right, right. And, you know, the, the truth of the matter is when when you get into uh, when you get into that that realm, right, the Starkitect realm. If mm -hmm. someone wants to hire, you know, Calatrava, they go hire Calatrava. Right. They don't go, oh, well, who's this firm in Toledo that says what sets them apart is their their like uh, 
quality of design, which yeah. you compare them to Calatrava. It doesn't happen, right? It just, no, like, it doesn't. It's like those generic perfumes at CVS. Like, if you like Giorgio, you'll love this one. <laughs> That's what they should put. They should put that on people's, people should put that on their website. Because what does that mean exactly? Design. If there's a million things that could mean, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you like Calatrava, you should check this out. If you want Calatrava <laughs> on a budget, you should, yeah, you should that that should not be the brand that you build. I'm just I'm just saying. But but it um you know, so for ninety nine point nine percent of the firms out there, it the focus has to be on, you know, what are you what are you doing for these people? What problems mm-hmm. are you solving for these people? And and it goes back, you know, in this book, it goes back to what are the questions that um what are the questions that they have and again it's you know marcus says that it's in the book it it people especially in 2023 are doing an enormous amount of their research and decision making before you even know that they exist yep before you even know that they're a prospective client and you you could say okay well once they're ready to hire somebody um, they can find me on my website or my social media or whatever, but in all reality, they've already, they've already narrowed the list down to three or made a decision and you don't even, you don't even know it. So why not, why not follow this framework? And, yeah. um, he, he calls it a business philosophy and I really do believe it's a business philosophy. I, I put it in that category. Yeah. Um, why not get ahead of it? Right. Right. Um, you know, because I will also say that architects do a lot more than just design. So yes, that's what sets yeah. you apart. Then what about all of the other 70%? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. You know, that, that's another one of my sort of pet peeves is, you know, we wh- why do architects leave so much on the table? You know, so much that comes before the the actual what we would call the design process because a lot of that design is dictated you know mm-hmm. the the program for the design is dictated you know months or years earlier why not be a part of that so there's a lot of money uh yep. on the table a lot of effort on the table up there yep. <laughs> chat says watch it good things come out of toledo <laughs> i'm talking about you chad <laughs> Ed says, if you like Frank Lloyd Wright, you'll love me. And the good thing is you're not, you're probably never going to compete head to head with Frank Lloyd Wright. Just saying. No, but there are a lot of architects who might say the same thing. And then at least, you know, you're looking at the right architects because these all, all these people say, if I love Frank Lloyd Wright, I'd love them. And I do love Frank Lloyd Wright because he's the only architect I've ever heard of. So there you go. There you go. Me being the client. Yeah. Yeah. This, so coming Coming in late 2023, Catherine's uh, <laughs> book on marketing architects like CVS, uh, like CVS fragrances. That's right. that's Catherine's new marketing uh, marketing philosophy. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Well, we could just have that be our own secret thing. We don't have to put it on our on our website. This is true. This is true. Uh, Catherine will consult with you on your uh, on your branding, yeah, your fragrance branding. <laughs> All right. Well, I know we're past the top of the hour. We are. Um, yeah, it, it went fast. Sorry for a little bit of a late start, technical difficulties. Um, but we can't leave without announcing next month's book. Oh, right, and, right, right. I forgot. Yeah, and probably we ought to. Um, I also to, uh, want to know who's going to implement these things. How are we yeah, going to help the public? Yeah, that's a good question. Who, who? So. Um, for along those lines, put put in the comments right now if you're going to try to implement something from they ask you answer. Just put yes or no, uh, or or say a maybe. Uh, put that in the in the comments now. For the context and clarity classroom, so I posted the the worksheets last night, both to the network and here in Facebook. Um, download those work through those questions are all related to the book. They're all related to our conversation yesterday with Marcus. The classroom will be open Monday at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be a little bit different because we're making Mm -hmm. a little bit of a pivot. And because Mark, our LePage, is actually going to host that on Monday instead of 
instead of me. But um, we'll talk about, uh, or you'll talk about implementing um, They Ask You Answer on uh, on Monday in the classroom. And the pivot is going to be, rather than doing the Context and Clarity classroom the Monday after the week, we're going to flip that around and we're going to start using the Context and Clarity classroom to focus on the week ahead. Yeah. So next next week will be a slightly uncomfortable because we're going to be in the midst of that pivot. But going forward, we're going to start using the classroom to start our work on the week. So I uh, we think maybe maybe that'll help with uh, with focus on the week and, and implementation. So that's coming up. But put in put in the uh, in the comments if you think you there's something that you've learned so far that you can implement for your firm. I already see some yeses. I see an I will and I see a yes and a yes. And uh, Jefferson says after he reads the book um, <laughs> and, and then he laughs. I, I think that means that uh, maybe mm, this book I is not no, probably not going to get to it. Yeah. He, he may not be um, actively reading the book at the time. I don't know. I don't know. All right. But I interrupted you. What is the next book? Uh, the moment I've been waiting for. Well, um, so b before we go there, our Context and Clarity Live guest next week, we'll take a baby okay. step in that direction. Next week, we will talk with David Drazil, who's an architect in Czechoslovakia. He is the uh, creator of Sketch Like an Architect. Mm -mm. If you've ever seen his post on Instagram, uh, to me, they're very cathartic just watching him. Uh, on Instagram or or, or uh, TikTok or somewhere, sketching and teaching how to sketch, uh, and, and he is a he is a wonderful artist. I mean, his his hand skills are top notch. He has leveraged that to create a course called Sketch Like an Architect, and then late last year he published the book Sketch Like an Architect. So I think next week um, hmm. with with David, I think first of all it's just going to be a fun conversation. Um, and I think we can kind of spend the, spend the week focusing on thinking about some of the skills that maybe we still use, maybe we're, 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 um, we're gaining, or maybe we do, we're mourning that we lost in school. I don't know, but, uh, but looking forward to that conversation. So that's, ne that's next week for context of 30 live. Okay. I'll post about that tomorrow morning for the book club for the month of March. Our book will be Rethink Innovation. And the way it's written is R-E colon Think Innovation. So Rethink Innovation by Carla Johnson. That'll be our book. Why does that sound familiar? I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, maybe I already read it, but it doesn't matter. I've forgotten it. Uh, may, maybe. Maybe. I mean, it's, I don't remember when it was published. Are going to have her on the show? We are going to have her on the show the day Maybe before. That's why it sounds familiar. Maybe that's why. <laughs> Maybe that's it. So okay. Carla Johnson will be our guest on Context and Clarity Live March 30th. And then March 31st is the last day of March and also the final Friday in March. We'll discuss her book, Rethink Innovation. Um, she is a well-known um, uh, keynote speaker talking about innovation and um, and she comes very highly recommended. Both her and the book come very very highly recommended. I have not read the book, so I'm looking forward to this one because it's a new one for me. Uh, but you have um, you have what several a uh, several we days head start. Time. We have you have five weeks to finish this book. There you go. Five weeks to finish. Rethink innovation by Carla Johnson. So that's our uh, March book club book. Uh, Chad says sketch. You dinosaurs still do that. <laughs> well, for so, and he says boomers. Uh, yeah, David. Yeah, not David boomers. is not a boomer. I don't. I don't know where he. I don't even. My guess is he's a millennial. I'm just kind of. Well, even you and I aren't boomers, Jeff. Even I. Correct. We are not. Even though I'm older than you, I'm still not a boomer. Correct. Just for the correct. record. Some people still sketch. Some people had those skills. Some people have those skills. Some of you may not have ever developed those skills. I didn't really have. I just kind of, I, I appreciate my own sketches, but they are not beautiful. No, fair enough. Fair enough. But I, 
I, uh, I remember a time this often on the sketching tangent, but I was working with a younger colleague. We were sitting with a client and, you know, we're, we're going, going over some schematic design things. And I said, I told our, my, you know, my young colleague, I said, Hey, grab a, grab a roll of sketch paper and sketch out what you're, what you're talking about. And, uh, he says, uh, I don't sketch. Oh, you totally set him up. Well, right I, I didn't know. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? You know, how's that even possible? Yeah, how says, is I, that I, possible? I mean, that's different than yeah. sketching yeah. the scene. He modeled, he modeled everything in, uh, in Revit. But he and doesn't know how to draw the, like draw it on the paper. Uh, no, I, it, it, my mind melted at that point. So wow. we had to go over to his computer while he, you know, he did like rough massing models in, in Revit. And, um, that was, um, Honestly, that was a very painful day for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I mean, I guess anyway. it's one thing. I, I mean, sketching a plan, I think we all probably do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I was what I was thinking was more perspectives and oh, you know, right. okay. massing and things like that. It, it was not, yeah, it wasn't plan it sketching. Was, it was. Well, that I can do. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, well, sketch know, like we'll, an architect. I, I'm going to get the book. Yep, we'll we'll learn how next week. Okay, well I'll learn how until next week. Oh well. There you go. Well, there thanks for right, this. I enjoyed it and I appreciate the recommendation. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks, thanks for humoring me. This is uh, I understand that books like this I completely geek out on. You um, know, you know, I I I like you, Jeff. So I'm interested in I'm interested in learning what you like, and then <laughs> thank you for, get a little insight. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right, everybody. Thanks for this week. It's been a good one. Lots of great conversations this week. Uh, have a great weekend. I will post about context and clarity for next week, tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, so look for that post both in the Entree Architect Network and the uh, and on in the Facebook group. And then we'll uh, we'll kick it off on Monday. I'll be over in the the uh, Entree Architect Network for our morning mindset conversation at eight thirty a.m. Monday, just 8.30 to 9, talk about uh, growth mindset for half an hour every morning. I'll be there, and then um, we'll see you next week. So thanks, everybody. Be well. Stay safe. Keep those around you safe and well. Find a little bit of time to breathe, relax, find some way to rejuvenate. We're 701 conversations in at this point. Thanks for going along this journey with us, and we'll pick it up again next week. Thanks, everybody. See you later.